Welcome to the chapter 13 wrap up. So now for meiosis, which is our topic for today, uh, this is going to involve two cell divisions. So meiosis 1 is going to involve going from one cell to two cells, two daughter cells, and then meiosis 2 will take those two daughter cells and ultimately give us four. So the result here is that we're going to go from one to four cells instead of in mitosis where we went from one to two cells. Now we're also going to go through and take a cell that was 2n and we're going to make that become ultimately a 1n cell or a haploid cell. So the process of meiosis will always start off diploid and it'll always finish off haploid. So each of these four cells will just be 1n. So half the chromosome number is the significant idea we want. So in humans, our normal diploid number is 46, so our haploid number is 23. If your diploid number was 50, your haploid number would be 25. If your diploid number was 100, your haploid number would be 50. So just keep that in mind whenever we talk about something and we say how many chromosomes would this thing have uh, if it's going on during this process. Just make sure you realize at the end of meiosis you would have half what you would normally have as just a normal somatic 2n diploid cell. And we've already brought up that the main purpose for this is that we're going to get variation. So that as we go through this process by divvying it up you don't know kind of which chromosome you're going to get. So for this first type of chromosome you can see there's two larger ones and then there's two I'll do a different shape, two smaller ones. You're going to get either, we can say the dark blue's dads, and we can say the light blue is moms. So you're going to get either moms or dads for that larger chromosome, and then either moms or dads for the smaller chromosome. So this allows for us to get different combinations in each gamete, which is why you're not normally going to see where two siblings, or never really in humans, uh, two siblings that came from separate gametes would ever look exactly alike or they would, that they would ever be genetically exactly alike. The only way you can get identical siblings is if they're identical twins, which means they came from one egg and one sperm, that as it was doing mitosis, so as the zygote that was formed does mitosis, somewhere along the way it accidentally split up. And so it broke in two, and each separate piece ultimately became a regular individual. So those two individuals can actually trace their heritage, if you will, back to the exact same sperm and the exact same egg. That's why they are uh, essentially identical genetically as far as their genetic code. But any other twins, any other siblings would not be identical because of this basic idea of we're shuffling up the genes. You know, you're going to pass on kind of a random half of your genes, and so does the other person. And so by doing so, we try to make sure that the siblings aren't alike because that's kind of our goal here is that we're going to mix and match so that hopefully somebody has the right amount of diversity to cope with whatever gets thrown at them. So next I want to talk about some of the difference between, differences between meiosis and mitosis. Because in general, meiosis is going to have the same steps. It's going to have interphase, the G1, S, G2. It's going to copy its DNA in the S phase, prep in G2. It'll go through prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, all the normal stuff, cytokinesis following that. So meiosis 1 will have all the phases that mitosis does. And then meiosis 2 will also have all the same things. But one of the big differences is during meiosis 2, as I just make sure I get this down, uh, remember that when during interphase of meiosis 2, you will not replicate your DNA. So you do not copy your DNA. That one's important because if we did copy our DNA between meiosis 1 and meiosis 2, we wouldn't get haploid cells. If you replicate your DNA and then divide, you get cells that are just like you. They're the same chromosome number. But because we don't copy our DNA uh, after meiosis 1, so essentially during meiosis 2, because we don't do that, it makes sure that we end up haploid. So you will not copy your DNA prior to meiosis 2. So I guess I'll do prior to. You won't do that. Uh, the other thing that we're going to have that goes on is during meiosis 1, so this will specifically occur in prophase 1, uh, we're going to have something called crossing over. And so I said you have mom's and dad's chromosome for each type of chromosome. So mom's chromosome 1, dad's chromosome 1. And then obviously you have the two chromatids because you've got mom's chromosome 1 and mom's copy of chromosome 1 because in meiosis 1 we do copy our DNA. And then you've got dad's chromosome 1 and his copy. So ultimately we have these two homologous chromosomes. So essentially that just means one's from dad, one's from mom. And we have their partner, their partner chromatid. So sometimes we'll call these tetrads because there's four chromatids. And because these guys are the equivalent chromosome, 
they have the same genes at the same spots. Now they don't necessarily code for the same thing for each gene, but they'll both have like the gene for height at a specific spot on the actual chromosome. One just might say tall, one just might say short. Now because they have these same locations for genes on the chromosome, these homologous chromosomes can actually flop over one another. And so the spot where they flop over we call a chiasmata or a chiasma. Uh, and that spot there is where synapsis or crossing over occurs. And that's where they literally swap a piece of the chromosome. So it's like trading. It'd be kind of like if you could take your arm, put it over somebody else's arm, and swap. So you have where part of your forearm and hand are from them, but the rest of your arm is from you, and vice versa. So this allows us to get even more variation because now it's just not just mom's chromosome or dad's chromosome, it can also be a huge mix of moms and dads because you don't know exactly which site along the chromosome crossing over will occur, if crossing over occurs at all. In some cases it can occur several times. I can tell you it's more likely to occur towards the ends of the chromosome because it's obviously where it's easier for it to happen. Uh, but you could have where kind of the front and the back both do it. So there's lots of different ways of mixing and matching these and this happens for each of our homologous sets, which would be 23 sets. Because of sex chromosomes, you're typically not going to do any type of crossing over because if you tried to cross over an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, you'd get a dead person. Uh, you can't mix and match those because you need the chromosome, the genes that are on your X chromosome. So if you mess up your X chromosome, you're, you're kind of screwed. Uh, not in a good way. So try to make sure that when you do this, you realize this is only going to be an autosomal thing. This is not going to be a sex chromosome thing. So this is one of the things we'll talk about later too, provides us with variation. But this occurs right at the beginning of meiosis one, and then so after meiosis one, even though I'll normally act like it's moms or dads only, in reality, any point after prophase one, these chromosomes can actually be any kind of mix of moms and dads. It'll still have the same genes though, but it doesn't necessarily have the same exact traits for each gene, because this chromosome might be like kind of here it's showing, where we said this is mom, so this one's mostly moms, but it has this dad stuff, and whatever genes are coded in here will now be dads, while these genes will still all be mom's specific version of it. Okay, next we've got the idea of what happens during meiosis one to our chromosomes. So in mitosis, you'll see that we line all of our chromosomes up along that metaphase plate, the middle. When we're talking about meiosis, we're actually gonna line them up with their homolog. So they're gonna line up double file, if you will, not single file. So they line up with their homolog, their buddy. So it's like that buddy system. If you guys remember in elementary school, if they made you line up and go to the restrooms, sometimes you might have done it single file. If you're on a field trip or something, sometimes you had your buddy, it was double file. And that means when they separate these chromosomes, in mitosis, we separate the chromatids, which then become their own chromosome as soon as they're separated. But when we talk about meiosis, we're not gonna do that we're gonna separate the homologous chromosomes. So if you look here, you'll see that this still has the two sister chromatids, the two copies uh, of that particular chromosome are still attached. So we don't grab one of each chromatid, we essentially grab mom's set of chromatids or dad's set, and this will occur randomly. So in this case, you can see it's got the larger chromosome from mom and the smaller chromosome set from dad, and then the other one obviously gets vice versa. But this could also have happened where the larger one was from dad, the smaller one was from mom, or both of them were from dad, or both of them were from mom. Uh, and the more chromosomes you have, the more complex this gets. Like for us with 46 chromosomes, there's a lot of combinations of how we can mix and match these, where you can get chromosome one from mom and the rest from dad, chromosome two from mom, the rest from dad, on and on and on and then you can double it up where you get like chromosome one, two, and three from mom and the rest from dad. So there's a lot of possibilities just from what we call independent assortment, which is just the idea that you're gonna get kind of a random grab bag of moms versus dads chromosomes. Now you only get one of each still, but once again, for chromosome one, which one are you gonna get? For chromosome two, which one are you gonna get? So this also will help out with the variation idea, but this is one of the key differences. Separate the homologs, don't separate the sister chromatids. Now, in meiosis 2, let me quick go back here. In meiosis 2, I do want to bring up that in, in meiosis 2, we will actually separate the chromatids. So in meiosis 2, we will go through and we'll have a normal metaphase set up where we will line them up in a single file line and then we will divide them. So this is how we get to being N. 
because you'll notice here at the end we have four chromosomes but at this point because we're starting off with half because we only grabbed one of each homolog pair so that means that ultimately we have a 2n number of chromatids but only a 1n number of chromosomes because I've only got two chromosomes here start with four now I've got two in each cell and so when I split these guys into the chromatids I only get two chromosomes in each cell and so meiosis 2 will actually act a lot like mitosis it's essentially mitosis but it starts with half the normal amount of chromatids so if I talk anything about meiosis 2 just think it's mitosis except we haven't copied our DNA so we have half the number of chromatids to start now independent assortment is this idea that we don't just have one type of chromosome all right we've got 23 different types of chromosomes if you remember they're labeled chromosome 1 is the biggest chromosome 22 is the smallest and then we have the sex chromosome set now for each of these we have kind of moms that we got from mom and we have dads that we got from dad so there's two options for each of these 23 types of chromosomes the one you got from mom or the one you got from dad now this is currently us just looking at the chromosomes at the start during meiosis 1 when they're technically paired up with their copy which would be the other sister chromatid we're going to kind of ignore that now and just treat them as 23 sets despite the fact it's actually going to be 23 sets that consist of pairs so they'll be mom set and then for that same chromosome type they'll be dad's equivalent set which will also have its copy we're also going to ignore crossing over which has gone on at this point and we're just going to treat them where it's kind of all moms and all moms copy and all dads and all dads copy so when these line up in 23 sets so that'd be one then we'd have another one where it's red and blue mom and dad all the way down the idea here is that you have two options you can get moms or dads for each of these chromosomes so there's two options so we'd usually just write two and then how many times we have to make this choice of moms or dads that's what the power is so this would be 2 to the 23rd power because we have 23 choices where we have to pick either or and so this gives us a possibility that comes out to about 1 in 8 million odds that we would produce identical sperm or identical ova just using independent assortment just using this idea that there are two different options for each chromosome type as we separate them out and then this will happen again due to crossing over that during meiosis 2 when you separate dad's and dad's copy assuming that that particular sperm got dad's chromosome 1 those aren't usually identical because crossing over has made them not identical because they can have portions of the mom's chromosome for that type and so if, as those split you can also get where there's this independent assortment idea that technically makes it even rarer than the 1 in 8 million for now we're going to keep it simple and just use this as just an idea of how rare it would be even ignoring crossing over and its effect to get two identical sperm so that's going to be 2 to the 23rd if this was like a fruit fly that only has say four types of chromosomes then you would typically say it's 2 to the fourth so you can see though that this number will change this number can get smaller uh, and if we're doing this fancy it'd be 2 to the n whatever the n number is so if you're a simple organism that has fewer types of chromosomes there will be fewer possibilities of different sperm and, and ova that you can produce by doing independent assortment this works out really well for for diversity in species that have lots of chromosomes because it gets to be even rarer than us because there's plenty of organisms that have well beyond ours you know in the 60s in some plants you even go up around a thousand there are quite a few things that have way more than us and so their odds of ever producing an identical sperm or ova even without crossing over is really 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 low but we don't just have independent assortment so we're also going to have the idea of crossing over which we'll call that recombinant DNA after it's done crossing over so you can see this one has done a partial crossing over with this chromosome you can see the other chromosomes did not cross over so they're all moms or all dads and then the same thing going on with the smaller guy where this one's essentially going to be all dads all moms and these ones have undergone crossing over so whenever crossing over occurs we get a new combination so it's not like it's just mom's chromosome or dad's chromosome that's independently assorting we now have this extra layer which we can't calculate very easily I don't think just because it's something that occurs and it, it does so based on probability it's not like this is something that you can plan out and know exactly how it's gonna happen and so we're gonna get all these recombinant DNA possibilities you're gonna have all these crossing over possibilities that make it even harder to have this work 
And then if you did the math for independent assortment, we're ignoring crossing over, we're just saying that this makes things really diverse. We're not going to do the math on it. But if you just do the math for the whole 23 squared, you're going to see that it comes out to 8 million. So that means there's a 1 in 8 million chance in a person that you make identical sperm. And there's a 1 in 8 million chance in females that they produce identical ovum which is going to be really rare because they don't have that many actual follicles that can develop into ovum, so probably never going to happen. But assuming that it did, you then also have to have this idea of random fertilization, where you have to have that 1 in 8 million identical sperm, find that 1 in 8 million identical egg and get together, or else they still wouldn't be identical offspring. And so when you go through and do the math on that, you'll see there's a 1 in 64 trillion chance that we could have identical offspring that are not identical twins, and that's ignoring crossing over. So probably never going to happen. You know, the odds of this are beyond remote. So it gives you a sense of just how much diversity we can manage, especially in an organism that has a fairly large N number, if you will. There's a lot more than us that you can get. You can get into the hundreds, but still a relatively large one, you can just see how huge this can balloon to and just how rare and almost impossible it would be to have two identical siblings that were not from the same sperm and not from the same egg, like identical twins. And so that should wrap up this chapter. Uh, if you guys have any questions, make sure you ask me in class, and I look forward to seeing you.